Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, Baker Institute for uh, <clears throat> this uh, special event we have with our distinguished uh, speaker. Um, you have uh, Ambassador Perkins biographic notes in your programs, and I'm not going to repeat all the uh, details of his uh, uh, accomplishments, decorations, and awards uh, that are listed there. Uh, simply put, he does represent, in my eyes, the very best of our United States Foreign Service. He has written a book, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and I would like to just refer to some of the uh, comments uh, in the jacket of that. Uh, he starts out, apartheid South Africa was on fire around me. Uh, this is how he begins the, his memoir of a career foreign service officer, the first uh, black American ambassador to South Africa, a really historic appointment. In 1986, uh, President Ronald Reagan uh, gave him the unparalleled assignment, dismantle apartheid without violence. If you have a mandate like that <laughs> as an ambassador, that's quite, that's quite a mandate. Not every ambassador that gets a historic mandate like that. Uh, and he fulfilled uh, this assignment, and as he was doing so, Ambassador Perkins was really uh, treated very, very hard by the American press, despised by the Africana government, hissed at by white South African citizens, and initially boycotted by black South African revolutionaries, including Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu. His uh, advice to President-elect George Herbert Walker Bush helped form American policy and hasten the release of Nelson Mandela and others from uh, prison. And uh, Secretary Baker and the ambassador were just trading some anecdotes when uh, Mr. Baker was Secretary of State, he visited South Africa, and it was that, during that trip where the clerk made this historic statement to Secretary Baker that he would be the last white president of South Africa. It was one of those tectonic plates moving in, in history. Ambassador Perkins, to achieve his success, drew on his expertise in conflict resolution, devotion to the U.S. Constitution, deep study of Asian philosophy, and training as a former U.S. Marine. I'm sure that latter helped you a great deal in that assignment. <laughs> He, uh, he has an up by a bootstraps life, took him from a cotton farm in segregated Louisiana, where he was raised by grandparents who could not read or write, uh, to the white elite foreign service. But I want to mention to you, Ed, that there were, at least there was one Armenian there, too, in that white elite foreign service group, <laughs> uh, where he became the first uh, African-American officer to ascend to the top position of the D Director General of the Foreign Service, and I can testify that he did a magnificent job in, in that uh, position. He was appointed as United States Ambassador four times to Liberia, South Africa, the United Nations, and to Australia. Uh, his colleagues and adversaries are figures of world history, Nelson Mandela, Winnie Mandela, Alan Payton, Samuel Doe, Boutros Boutros Ghali, uh, Albertina Sisulu, Walter Sisulu, and Secretaries of State, uh, Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, James A. Baker III, Lawrence Eagleburger, and Colin Powell. He served for President Ronald Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush, Gerald Ford, uh, Jimmy Carter, and Bill Clinton. So we couldn't ask for a more distinguished uh, diplomat to grace our presence tonight and to give his views on uh, the U.S. and the emerging second uh, world. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Ambassador Perkins. Thank you very much, Ambassador DeRegin, Mr. Secretary, Susan, fellow Marines, <laughs> citizens, and friends of the Baker Institute. I can't tell you what a great pleasure it is to be here and, and to say a few words about, about the United States and challenges coming up, up the stream. I would like to say just a bit about uh, South Africa, though. Uh, I think perhaps no other post uh, tested what I have to give as a public servant than perhaps South Africa. 
the United Nations perhaps as well. But I'd like to give you uh, two anecdotes. Both of them concern Secretary Baker. When I was ambassador to South Africa, the Africana government decided to try to release a couple of people from Robben Island prison to see how they would act. And one of them was a little known revolutionary named Govan Mbeki, the father of the present uh, president. And he and I talked when he came out and I asked him what he was going to do if the ANC came to power, and he said, we're going to nationalize everything. And I said, comrade, if you do that, South Africa will become a dust bowl. Whereupon we entered into a spirited conversation. And he said, look, capitalism has been the enemy of the people. And we can't come to power without doing something for the people. We can't do it if we don't nationalize things. I said, well, you'll be doing them greater harm by nationalizing it. He said, well, what would you do? I said, well, I'd uh, try something called community capitalism. <clears throat> I told you I didn't know what I was talking about. But it came on the spur of the moment, and he said, well, what's that? And I told him, I said, well, capitalism has one rule first. They have to make money and a profit. I said, but once they make a profit, I think it's reasonable to expect that they leave some of it in the community. And the community should have a say in how that money is used. Crushes, kindergartens, clean streets, clean water, and things like that. So the more we talked, the more intrigued he became. He says, okay, that's fine, <clears throat> but your government will never go along with it. I said, okay, we'll see. Frankly, I never reported it. As history and luck would have it, Secretary Baker asked me to go with him to Namibia to represent the president as that country became independent. On the way down, he learned that he had been invited to come into South Africa and meet with the revolutionary leaders. And he turned to me nationally and says, what are they going to ask me? And I said, they're, they're going to ask you to talk about how you see South Africa emerging. And I said, well, what will you say? And he said, well, I'll talk about the market economy. I said, if you do that, you're going to be challenged. And the challenge will be that capitalism is the enemy of the people. But he did, he did talk about it. He was asked to comment on what South, Af South Africa should be in the future. And he said, well, I urge you to adopt a market economy approach. Sure enough, Govan and Becky stood up and said, we consider capitalism to have been the enemy of the people all these years. What do you mean by a market economy? The secretary said, well, it's too difficult to explain in short time. But what I'm thinking about is something called community capitalism. <laughs> <clears throat> He finished his remarks, and we went out on the lanai and to take pictures. And Becky rushed over to me, and he said, what did you do to get that man to say that? <laughs> what he really said, Mr. Secretary, was, what did you do to get that white man to say that? <laughs> I said, well, that's, that's his view. After South Africa was over, I was back as Director General. That appointment spurred on by this Secretary of State. And one day he, he caught me uh, across the river at one of the offices and said, uh, are you sitting down? I said, yes, I will sit down. He said, the President is thinking about appointing you ambassador to the United Nations. What do you think about that? I said, I'd like to go. He said, wait a minute, don't you think you ought to go home and ask your wife first? <laughs> <laughs> I've had a great career, and it's a temptation to talk a great deal about South Africa and about the book, Mr. Ambassador, Warrior for Peace. 
But I've been thinking in the past few months, I've been trying to understand and to rationalize and identify the challenges facing the United States and what one author calls the second world. That's an emerging economic, political, and social phenomenon composed of nations that are really moving from what we call the third world into what I call and what an author called uh, Parag Khanna calls the second world. As I try to set the stage for these few remarks I'm going to give, I'd like to quote from some writing that he has done at a place called the New America Foundation, reviewed a few weeks ago in the New York Times Magazine. He says this, we now have three hemisphere pan regions dominated by America, by Europe, and by China. But in a globalized and shrinking world, no geography is sacrosanct. So in various ways, both overtly and under the radar, China and Europe will meddle in America's backyard. America and China will compete for African resources in Europe's southern periphery. And America and Europe will seek to profit from the rapid economic growth of countries within China's growing sphere of influence. Globalization is the weapon of choice. The main battlefield is the second world. The second world is not in the core of the first world, but it's doing things that third world nations were not doing some time ago. These are the countries that are taking advantage of resources discovered in their countries. These are countries where education has taken hold. And these are countries that are going to provide the challenges of leadership, of innovation to the first world countries, and more particularly to those that we call the Perm Five at the Security Council, and those that control most of the resources, and those that determine how these resources are going to be used. Certainly the United States is in that category, and certainly the United States is challenged. The other four members, certainly Great Britain, France, China, and Russia, but more especially the European Union. They're going to be challenged, and so are we. The role that came to the United States through the application of something called Manifest Destiny meant that the United States, in my judgment, was manifested since the 1820s to provide some kind of leadership that's different than it had been experienced before. Many of you will recall that Woodrow Wilson tried to enact something called collective security through the League of Nations. He failed, partly because of misunderstanding of the political situation at home, but I don't think the United States was quite, re quite ready to sign on to something like that. But it was never forgotten. And it was, of course, President Roosevelt working with Winston Churchill that brought it into fruition by backing something called the United Nations. The second world, and I'm choosing to call this phenomenon facing us the second world and borrowing that phrase from Kana, but the second world has learned that the world boils itself on fossil fuels, on the internationalization of capitalism, of good education, and of working within 
the financial institutions to make themselves, what shall I say, uh, de- not prone to make mistakes in managing foreign affairs and managing economic activities. So the participation of this second world and the self-actualization that comes with it is going to be a great challenge to the United States and to the other first world nations. Now having said that, I think I'll try to uh, address the capacity and the needs of the first world in managing the benefits of globalization and the cooperation that must come from first world nations if they are to be able to lead through ideas and through demonstration of participation. The capacity of these nations, and especially the United States, will be a challenge that we've never faced before. I proceed from the view that nations who share a great deal of the world's power can rise to this occasion, especially the United States. That doesn't mean that I think the United States is capable of doing it just now, because there are lots of questions that need to be answered in terms of what this first and second world now means. New new leadership and new ideas is an absolute. I continue to believe that the United States can provide these ideas and this leadership, but it must bring about something which, which I prefer to call the unity of humankind. It seems to me the time has come to address these critical issues. And the first I like to think about is a theory of justice. I turn my attention to that because I consider it to be the essential food for the advancement of humankind. I owe a great deal to John Rawls, late professor at Harvard University. I owe a great deal to my ability to function as a diplomat, as a public servant, to this man. In 1971, Rawls published 20 plus years of research in a theory of justice. Provides one of the several pathways to intelligent thinking about how this species, humankind, can save itself. During my time as an ambassador, certainly during my time as a diplomat and a public servant, I find and have found that justice is in short supply around the globe. But where there is justice, or where there is a modicum or a pattern of justice, nations seem to improve. People seem to improve as citizens of the world. Why justice, you may say? Because in my judgment, I repeat, people improve with a sense of justice, both real and imagined. If it's absent, it must be addressed. And it must not be given, as my grandmother used to say, a wink and a nod. It must be real. Justice as fairness is one part of uh, Rawls' book that I want to talk about tonight. It imposes on the governing, governing elite and the government structures an obligation to make the level, make the playing field a lot more level. Fair terms of social cooperation are to be given by an agreement reached by the people themselves. And when people cannot agree on a moral authority, which is the basis of their government, and in my experience as a diplomat, and particularly in South Africa, then chaos will obtain. In South Africa, the concept of justice was looked at by the Afrikaners, especially the Afrikaner government, 
and the black revolutionaries in different ways. Each saw it differently. But Alan Payton, who wrote Cry the Beloved Country, saw it in a manner which I think we ought to adopt. And that is, humankind must be elevated to a position which makes humans what they are supposed to be, absolute superhuman beings who have respect for other human beings. So this thing that we call manifest destiny for so, for so long in our life has now come full circle and faces the United States as we take on this new second world. There's a, a lot of gaps between the haves and the have-nots. And I want to address one more time, this time very seriously, the concept of capitalism, which I think must be different as we merge into this new world. It's been a long time since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. As the idea has, has advanced and institutionalized, it's been an important backstop to the, to the Western nation's improvement and development. However, in spite of all the successes of capitalism, it is seen by many people, many nations, as the most fundamental post in the institution of a cooperating society, but it has also left many people, many nations, lacking, lacking the means to provide a good meal or good education. However, capitalism as opposed to socialism, um, there is no contest. Socialism has not yet provided the answer and does not give any indication that the answer will be coming anytime soon. But I do believe that capitalism can be modified such that it is not the enemy of the people, but in fact, not just the friend of the people, but the absolute essential food for the people to improve themselves. I could not have argued against Goldman and Backey if I had not had some experience living on a cotton farm and watching people who refused to say that I can't do it, but instead did it, and who said to me, don't ask anybody to do it for you. You can do it, because there's always a way. Having said that, though, nations like the United States must provide the guidance, must provide the food, but not do it for them. It must hope that when they provide the food, that it will be done and that it will multiply. So long as there is a view called justice is fairness, it seems to me that capitalism will rise to the occasion to try and reinvent itself. And a part of that reinvention must accept the view that, as I said, business or whatever outfit puts money forth to make money must make money, must make a profit. But I think there's a good argument to be made that part of that profit should be left with the community on the basis that communities hold nations together and therefore we must all participate in it. I want to now turn to value, the value of dissent and partisanship. I can't think of a better example to use in describing the value of this than Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. A most eloquent explanation of the pluses that come from dissent. It's essential that things like freedom, social equality, justice, both economic and social, must be a growing and learning experience. It was 
Martin Luther King, who said in that letter that this dissent is sometimes necessary because it means that it's a way for all people to take advantage of the concept of liberty. I call to, am called to mind, uh, I'm reminded of two authors, Berlin, Isaiah Berlin, and Amartya Sen. Both of these authors talked about justice, fairness, and liberty. They talked about liberty in its negative sense and liberty in a positive sense. There are theoreticians and practitioners who will use liberty as a minus, and there are those who see it as a plus. Both of these authors are in that category. And some of you may, may recall that Immanuel Kant, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Hegel all pointed to positive liberty associated with self-mastery and the capacity to determine one's self and destiny. It's this positiveness that the United States attempted to implant in apartheid South Africa. It's true, the president said, I want you to do it without violence, and uh, you, you will not get any instructions from us because we don't know what to tell you. But each time I came back to see the president, he sat down with me. <clears throat> and he asked, well, what's been going on for the past six months? Each time I talked about justice as fairness, and uh, I think it was President Reagan who said, have you ever met Griffin Bell, who was Jimmy Carter's uh, attorney general? And I had not. He said, well, go and see him. And ask him what the judges in this country did to implement Brown versus the Board of Education. It was through them that I convinced the South African judiciary that they can make laws because judges do make laws. So accordingly, this new leadership that we have called upon must mean that sometimes when we implement justice, we'll have to make laws. This self-mastery which we are asking the world to take on must be our forte as well. Now, I'd like to mention just once United Nations. It's a controversial subject, but having once been the ambassador to the United Nations, courtesy of uh, Secretary of State Baker and President Bush, I've come to view the United Nations as a necessity, a necessary tool in diplomacy. It's not a perfect tool, and it never will be. It needs a lot of tinkering with. But it is the element of collective security that, that can be used most effectively by, nation, by nations that claim to embrace freedom, democracy, and justice. The United Nations can only be what we make it. Both Churchill and Winston, both Winston Churchill and President Roosevelt believed that the UN would, would more easily succeed if there were a board of directors composed of the most powerful nations at that time. <clears throat> they were the United States and the Soviet Union. Great Britain came along third. France was not a nation at that time because it had been suborned by Germany. Grand Charles de Gaulle was uh, renting space in London. But both Churchill and Roosevelt believed that France could rise, that Russia, that Soviet Union had to be a member, and that there had to be an Asian member. The only Asian member that was on its feet at that time was China. And so the five were born, two very powerful nations, 
a third, powerful in intent, but sorely tested as a result of the war. That's Great Britain. Now these nations are still there. The Security Council is the only really effective element of the UN. The General Assembly is the people's house, the people being the nations. It's at once an air chamber for people to let off air. It's also, it's also a place for people to debate and feel that they have gotten their due. The Security Council is the one that does all the work. It's a call for the Security Council to be changed. There's a view that the five ought to be changed. If not the five changed, then there ought to be other members who are made permanent members. Already Germany and Japan have made claim, and the United States has gone on record as saying they support permanent membership of these two nations, but without the veto power. There's a call for regional representation. I oppose any what shall I say, any membership of the permanent membership beyond 20 people, 20 nations. When you get more than 20, in my judgment and my experience, people talk, nations talk, and action is absent. However, my point here is that the new leadership demanded of these nations of the first world must embrace the UN. May I now turn to, to an issue that is of importance to you, importance to me, and that is a world free of nuclear weaponry and support of peaceful uses of nuclear power. I might just say that uh, Kant talked about perpetual peace I think we may have a chance to try to make that come true if we can harness the threat of nuclear power devastation. A group of concerned leaders, including former Senator Sam Nunn, former Secretary of State George Shultz, are working to make real a wake-up call to make the world free of nuclear weapons. The responsibility of the leadership of the first world and in a second world must be unreservedly concerned about the possible non-peaceful use of nuclear power. It's imminent and it's devastating. A case can be made for taking this one step further in attempting to make time, make double time in harnessing nuclear power. Now may I turn to the two nations that are in bed with each other, whether they like it or not, and that's the United States and China. Having been a student of Asian philosophy for a lot of years, I, this is a favorite subject of mine because I have a great understanding of Chinese history so far. As Henry Kissinger is fond of saying, they've had 5,000 years of it unbroken. That's true. It's unbroken, but they've had lots of wars inside. But more importantly, these two nations, in my judgment, are destined to play new roles as the new worlds come on stream. Back at the University of Oklahoma and, and in other places, I've turned my attention more and more to the academic understanding of the history of China, but more importantly of the philosophy of Sun Tzu and others who eschewed war for war's sake, but talked about understanding oneself before you go to war and thus make war unnecessary. Whatever we do in China, with China, must be based on understanding the history of China, must be based on understanding the philosophy of Sun Tzu. If we don't, we will fail. 
in my judgment, the United States is best posed to, to understand what China is. And as, as I end these remarks, I want to talk about China's foray into Africa as the beginning of my discussion that Africa as a continent is of essentiality, is an essential element in the United States move to provide leadership for this second world. It's an important continent. Mutual security is just one element that we can expect help from. The important, the, the important element of education has worked well in Africa so far, but we need to take the continent as a whole. We need an equally full share of justice all across Africa. We need to look for ways to encourage, but not tell, to encourage African nations to find ways to not fight each other, but to have peaceful uses of the resources available. We need to make sure that we can have a trade activity on that continent so that the nations of Africa can sell what they make, make money, and buy that which we make. Africa is also a great area for research and development. We will need Africa just as it needs us. But the United States should take the lead, working with the European Union, with China, and other nations, and making sure that Africa does not become, once again, a continent exploited by the other world nations. Now, what I've said tonight is this. The world is changing. The United States has had a marvelous experience so far, but it has had a very short experience. The philosophies that we have put forth, Manifest Destiny, and even the Monroe Doctrine, but certainly the Marshall Plan, all of these elements have brought a better world most of the time. And what it has done is given us a philosophic intent, an intent to provide a world for our citizens that is devoid of fighting, that has respect, that respects justice, and to provide an example for the rest of the world to follow. I think we need to make sure that we don't lose that. The respect that the United States has garnered over all these years of independence is at risk. It's at risk because the world is in turbulence and our voices are not heard in places where it ought to be heard, where it was heard before. And when it's heard, it's not heard as we, we want it to be heard. We can do better. The world can do better. But I think the United States is at a point where it has to make sure that that, part, that position is made over and over in the councils of power, in the activities themselves. And so, as we enter this new world, new millennium, We've got some, we'll have a new president pretty soon. All of these things will be on that president's desk and will be on that president's shoulder. But nothing will happen unless citizens make it happen. Foreign policy is not the reserve of diplomats like myself. It's the reserve of the people. During President Truman's initial term as president, he and a senator from Kansas enacted a law which made it possible to send diplomats to various parts of the country and to learn what the people do. The president said, I'm afraid 
that maybe the diplomats don't know whom they serve. And so I'm saying that the country, the United States, serves itself, serves its people, and by example, the world. Thank you very much. Ambassador Perkins is uh, willing to take some questions from the audience, and uh, please uh, just raise your hand and uh, uh, pose your questions. Yes, sir. Has the uh, situation in Kenya, uh, uh, do you feel that, that uh, what has been worked out is going to hold <coughs> over a period of time? Are you encouraged by it? And you, what do you think the future looks like in Kenya? I have two thoughts. I'm encouraged by it. The probability of success is about 50-50 in my judgment. Uh, I think the former Secretary General, Kofi Annan, uh, did a pretty good job in patching together a, a model that I think both sides will accept. What is your formula for getting young professionals interested in public service? My, <laughs> my formula is that uh, it should not be left to recruiters, but the institutions of the community, I often say, and especially the ecumenical community, the YMCA, YWCA, Chambers of Commerce, and other elements, including public schools at grade school level, must be much more interested and involved in talking about the concept of foreign affairs and foreign policy and public service. I ran across an old textbook given to me by my grandmother. The title of it was Citizenship. I doubt whether really, well, anybody ever publishes a book like that anymore. But in it was an explanation of the Constitution at that time, explaining what it, what it meant. We have to have more citizenship books and citizenship discussions and the emphasis on understanding that we are our protectors. It's not someone over there. It's not the Pentagon. It's us as citizens. No greater protection. There is no greater protection than citizenship, in my judgment. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you could tell us which two countries in Africa have the best public education system at the present time. In my judgment, uh, Senegal and possibly Ghana at this time. But that doesn't mean the others don't have the basic uh, foundations for it. It just means that it's not practice. And too many other things that get in the way. Yes, uh, we've read recently that Zimbabwe is literally uh, on the verge of economic collapse, and uh, the country could uh, uh, venture into total chaos in the next few months. Uh, do you have any comments, and do you see any kind of bright future or hope in that area? I do not see a bright future for Zimbabwe. In my judgment. Uh, the president, uh, President Mugabe, has uh, lost his stability, uh, lost an understanding of what it means to be an elected leader, and succumbed to the view that he's going to be there forever. Not only that, I'm, I'm disappointed in South Africa's response to him, the current president's response to him. 
instead of condemning it. He has encouraged it by silence or at least intemperate remarks that the West is pushing him too far. It is one of the saddest cases in Africa that I know of today. They may say, well, why don't we do something about it? Well, I, I would say perhaps maybe the United States has been a little bit too timid in expressing concern that a country so promising at one time has lost its footing without in any sense saying that Comrade Mugabe is a menace, but to say that the country and the basis upon which it was formed is at risk. The citizens are marching into South Africa every day at an alarming rate. And pretty soon there won't be any people left in Zimbabwe. That may be the answer to it. Do you think, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be practical or even possible to form some kind of diplomatic organization, as you mentioned, uh, that President Truman did, to go into different parts, to go over the country and try with the sole purpose of getting citizens involved or asking their opinions about a public policy? Oh, I, I wouldn't call it that, but I do think that we need to double and perhaps triple our Peace Corps activities and uh, look for perhaps, what shall I say, perhaps in addition to the mandate of the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps needs to include people of all ages and all professions, teachers, mechanics, people who can make balloons, people who can write textbooks, comic books. It needs to demonstrate the totality of the American experience. Would you support the reestablishment of VISTA? I would indeed, without hesitation. Yes, sir. You haven't said anything about the sometimes volatile continent of South America. What do you think we should know about South America that apparently we haven't learned? Well, <laughs> South America, the hemispheric uh, area, has most of the time, most of the time, been neglected because it's a part of us, and we, at least the United States sees it as a part of us. They're individual nations, and sometimes our policy has treated them as juveniles, even if they are juveniles. <laughs> we, need a, we need a much larger presence of Peace Corps activities. But more importantly, there are some leadership nations there. Um, Cesar Chavez is not one of my preferred leaders, but Bolivia is, for example. Um, certainly, uh, Argentina has a chance to be a leader. Colombia is not one of them. So this idea of South Level border has eluded us from time to time. I think President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, good neighbor policy and a, a good chance of perhaps success. But it didn't continue. Uh, during uh, the first few days of, uh, of uh, President Bush 41's term, we gave a great deal of, of uh, attention to a new South Africa, a new trade region. Somehow that has seemed to atrophy along the way. 
I don't know what has to be done. If, you know, if I knew, I, I might have been uh, president or something, but I don't know. Um, <clears throat> almost nightly, we can see things on TV where Iran, with their threats, and Israel, and the terrorism that's going on, uh, do you see the UN as gaining more power as the keep peacekeeping force in the world? Uh, that that it gains, it's going to gain more power because of nuclear terrorism that could happen in the world. I don't see the UN getting more power. <clears throat> Nor do I see the UN as capable of uh, of making the difference. But here's what I do see. Chapter 6 and 7 of the Charter talks about first the peaceful settlement of disputes and chapter 7 with force. I don't support a standing army for the UN. Uh, certainly not in this day and age. But I do support a standing understanding amongst nations that they will come to the forefront with the means, diplomatic and otherwise, of settling disputes without first having to to dispute among themselves the appropriate method of doing so. The United States has spent a lot of money on peaceful uh, forays. I'm not sure that that has been the right thing to do without other nations performing the same way. So I guess what I'm saying is that there has to be a concert of nations dedicated to solving peaceful dangers, the dangers to peace, such as Iran. It's taken a long time to get to this point, and I'm not sure from day to day whether the Europeans and the Americans are talking to each other or not. i take one last question. Yes, sir. I'd just like to say that personally thank you for your many years of service to our country. And Edward J. Perkins, you are a great American. Thank you.